The topic is your food has a climate story and how to tell it. We know storytelling is key. So to moderate this panel, we have no other than the inspiring Brie Jelinas. A brief intro, Brie is the program director of Real Food and Real Stories, a nonprofit that uplifts inspiring personal stories from the Bay Area Food Company and curates virtual monthly gatherings to inspire the next generation of real food advocates. And Brie, storytelling has been a prominent element throughout your career. Um, Throughout the decades, you have worked in, many, in numerous initiatives with indigenous people in their plith against, you know, environmental and social injustice. So, Brie, we're really honored that you're here with us moderating the panel and you have wonderful other panel, panelists. So, I'll hand the virtual stage over to you. Thank you for being with us and take it away. Thanks so much, Angie. Thanks for that wonderful intro. Uh, very grateful to be here with you all today and a huge thank you to Arno and the team for putting on this wonderful event. Um, I, I'm really honored to be able to moderate this panel today. I think stories are incredibly vital to being able to share our purposeful work with um, people out there, particularly when it comes to climate. Um, and today we have really phenomenal panel to be able to talk through a lot of these issues and give some advice around um, how your food has a climate story and how to tell it. So we will focus on how to tell stories of your brands and products to con consumers to receive maximum impact and also how we can best share our passion for climate action while simultaneously engaging consumers. So uh, without much further ado, I would love to um, invite all three of our panelists onto the call. We have Ryan Quintaro Vertner, Christine Su, and um, hopefully Miyoko Shina will also be joining us. So I would love to just give a really brief intro. Ryan Quintaro Vertner is the founder and principal of Smoketown. Um, it's a boutique consultancy that helps mission driven brands maximize their ROI against marketing, sales, and social and environmental impacts. And he is on the executive board of Flock, a new regenerative food and ag fund and accelerator, and also Naturally Chicago, a network of natural product companies in Chicagoland. So Ryan is a lifelong activist, fifth generation innovator, and 13 year veteran of CPG industry, in addition to holding an MBA from the University of California's Huss School of Business. So welcome, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Next, we also have Christine Su, an activist entrepreneur currently leading product for conversational safety at Twitter. So important. And until June of this year, Christine was co-founder and CEO of Pasture Map, really incredible ag software platform used on 6 million plus acres globally. And Christine is an entrepreneur in residence at Food System 6 that a lot of us know about, advising regenerative meat companies, and is also a board member of Kitchen Table Advisors and a voting member of the board of Greenpeace. So welcome, Christine. Happy to be here. And we also have with us today Miyoko Schinner. Miyoko is the fearless CEO founder of Miyoko's, a food brand combining culinary traditions with food technology to really revolutionize dairy by making cheese and butter without cows. Uh, Miyoko's very successfully replaced animal dairy products on the shelves of more than 15,000 retailers and is a passionate culinarian, former restaurateur, best-selling cookbook author, co-host of the national TV cooking show, Vegan Mashup, and a founding board member of Plant-Based Foods Association. And not to mention also has co-founded a farmed animal sanctuary in California that provides a home to over 70 farm animals. So welcome to you, Miyoko. Nice to see everybody. So great to have you all here. I couldn't have um, thought of better people to really talk about what we're really wanting to tackle today, which is really how we can most impactfully talk about our climate story through our brands so let's get straight into it. We've got kind of a short period of time here and so much that we can cover. Um, 
To kick things off, there's a big question and a lot of tension between storytelling that's focused on climate and storytelling that's focused on the brand's authentic role on climate. Um, and the difference is really subtle, but it's incredibly important. So I'm going to pass the first question to kick us off to Ryan. Love for Christine and Miyoko to add also to this. So Ryan, as a mentor to food entrepreneurs, people rely on you for sound advice. Can you please give us some tips on how to be authentic with your brand voice and also naming some examples? Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's such an honor to, to share the stage with uh, the likes of Christine and, and Miyoko. Um, you guys have done great work. So uh, it, the, I think that the difference between just talking about your brand's climate story or talking about climate generally, the difference between that and telling that story authentically and with power is really the difference between whether your brand uh, and in how many ways your brand genuinely has an impact on improving the climate. You know, so there's, there's sort of a self-assessment that everyone in the audience can do. Uh, if you're a founder, if you're a CEO, if you're a head of marketing, um, there's, there, here's some questions to ask yourself. Think of the climate story that you'd like to tell or the climate story that your brand is telling and ask yourself how many aspects of your business are reinforcing of that story. So, you know, it, it, does your supply chain reinforce your climate story? Does the packaging, you know, structure and packaging materials reinforce it? Your ingredients, uh, your own personal mission, your team's passion. The more of those things where the answer is yes, then the more powerful and authentic your brand storytelling can be because you can pull in all of these aspects of what the brand is truly doing, which will ultimately translate into a story that has a lot more stickiness and a lot more impact on consumers. Because at the end of the day, you're not just telling a climate story for uh, purely altruistic reasons. You're telling a climate story in order to sell more of your product, in order to be able to do better in the world and do more good in the world. That we, we talk about that at Smoketown as a virtuous cycle uh, that, that we help uh, companies create uh, through this idea that, that, that we have of the big fight. So the big fight is, is you know, the, the commitment that a, that a brand and a company makes that's so crystal clear that it's deeply embedded in the brand's DNA and what the company is up to uh, kind of in a 360 degree way. So uh, there's a bunch of great examples out there uh, when you asked me that question, the first one that came to mind, actually a bunch of you were in the Bay Area. I, I, I'm actually the only one not in the Bay Area on this panel, right? Um, I lived in the Bay Area for 20 years and uh, knew a bunch of folks at Method Home Cleaning. Uh, to me, they're one of the OGs in, in the space of figuring out how to do really impactful uh, storytelling around their impact on climate, but doing it in a way that's authentic and fully embedded and how, the, how that business is built. But a more recent example uh, is, I would say both Epic Provisions, the meat snack company, and Force of Nature Meats, which is a regenerative uh, uh, fresh meat brand, both founded by the same uh, team. And uh, to me, what's powerful about what they're up to is in both cases, every aspect or as many aspects as they could of what those businesses are about and how they're built and the way they tell their story, maximize that checklist that I talked about before, where they source their meat, how they talk about the land, uh, land stewardship, even just as a principle. I mean, Epic, Epic Provisions was doing that before it was cool. So um, anyway, uh, the, the, that's kind of my take on it. And those are a couple of examples of folks who I think do it particularly well. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Such great example there. Um, curious, Christine and Miyoko, if you want to jump in as well, just talk a little about how, you know, really being able to be authentic with your brand um, and telling that story, if there's any examples through your specific brands. Uh, sure, I'll jump in here. I mean, it, it's sort of ironic because to be honest, I don't think we've done a very good job of telling that story. Uh, it's a story that we talk about internally all the time. We've done a life cycle analysis of our products, uh, all of our cashew-based products. Uh, that is not the, the recently launched products this year. We're about to launch that uh, soon. Um, 
We talk about climate. I, I read major uh, articles and papers on um, climate studies, and we discuss it internally all the time. However, um, the storytelling that we have been doing has been not so much about our products so much, but simply about the climate in general and about the, uh, so, so we have done, we've talked about the, the need to reverse climate change. Um, when I give talks, I discuss this all the time. It's a focal point of pretty much every talk I give, uh, that as well as animal welfare. So I talk about those issues all the time, um, wherever I am. And we talk about it internally, and we talk about uh, the need to do something in order to ensure that we have a planet to live on, because we are in dire circumstances right now. We don't have many years left. Um, and so uh, we talk about it as a major problem in the world, but we haven't done a very good job of tying it into our brand, which I guess in some ways is actually authentic, because we've talked about the bigger problem than simply, you know, gee, what are we doing to jump on that bandwagon? Um, what we have to do now, I think, as a brand is to do a better job of telling our story and why we've chosen to make the products that we've chosen to make. Yeah, gonna yeah Christine, to, jump I mean, in. I'm not going to pretend to have the brand experience that Ryan and Miyoko have. Um, I will say that in the years that I've been in regenerative ag and, and consulting for regenerative brands, um, I some of the gaps that I've noticed are talking about climate as if it's a separate story from justice uh, yeah. and from communities. Um, talking about animals or about the planet uh, without talking about people. So that is, that's a core to the work that um, we did a path to math with tech company, right? We're not really a brand that's, that's marketing to consumers, but um, it, if we're talking about regenerative, and I know we're among friends here um, in this community, if we're talking about regenerative, it can't just be regenerative on grass or soil or sucking carbon down. It also needs to be regenerative to the people who work for you, the farmers that we're trying to support and everybody who's involved in the food supply chain as well. And if it's not regenerative in terms of an equity perspective or for people to truly be thriving, then it's also part of an extractive system. Uh, and that's something that, to Miyoko's point, um, it's really difficult for brands to square. Like it's not, it's not possible as a small business founder to save everything in every part of the supply chain. Like we certainly did, we're not able to do that. But I think, um, struggling in public is something that I'm a really big fan of uh, as a founder uh, because it, it, it does bridge that gap of um, authenticity and letting people know where you're at in the journey and, and how you're thinking about it. And one brand that I, that I absolutely love um, is Diaspora Co. Yep. I know Sana's somewhere here. Uh, and uh, the, the, the idea of wrestling with what does the spice trade look like today? And how are we going to not only source the best spices that are regionally raised, but like centering the people who grow the spices and everybody along the supply chain, uh, to me is very much part of a climate justice story and a uh, climate, uh, climate story without a climate justice story just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, such great points, Christine. And um, it definitely you know, brings me to this idea of, you know, we are in this crisis. It's, um, there are only a certain number of years uh, for us to really like move the needle significantly to um, being able to really still have a planet inhabitable. Um, how strongly would you suggest for you know brands? You know, there's young entrepreneurs on this call to be able to like really push forward these the climate aspect of their brands, do you think it needs to be as loud and clear as possible? How subtle or not should that be at this stage? I'll Is that a question? Oh. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Miyoko. Okay, I mean, it's just interesting when you read all the consumer research, you know, they all seem to say that consumers are most concerned about health and taste and environment is gaining traction among the Gen Zers and uh, maybe the millennials, but it's not as uh, high of a priority for, for uh, you know, for baby boomers and 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 uh, older people, older generations. Um, same thing with animal welfare; that's even lower than environment. Um, I think it, the role of industry is to make those things important. Mm -hmm. We have a moral obligation in order to save the planet to make to bring consumers up 
to the level where environment, animal welfare, uh, human justice are just as important as personal health. Because I always say, what difference does it make how healthy you are if the planet's dying? You know, it doesn't matter if you have um, six pack abs and you can run a marathon. If uh, the world is crumbling around you, if animals are dying, if we're losing species, if there's wildlife habitat destruction and species extinction, and people are in food deserts, what difference does it make how healthy you are? So we have to really just shift consumer perception away from focus on themselves to focus on the entire world. And that's the responsibility of industry. We've screwed it up. Now we got to fix the problem. I want to reinforce what Miyoko just said. Uh, I and I've been getting more and more clear and focused on that on that moral imperative to talk about this uh, over even frankly just over the last like year or two, because I think that part of the climate crisis is that there are not enough voices talking about it and talking about it with authority and talking about it in ways that um, help open people's minds and hearts to uh, how serious this is and also how concretely their choices as an individual can impact the outcome. Uh, so I think it's, you know, we've got nine years, Frank. I mean, we've got nine years to, to reverse this thing or else we start to be in some serious, serious trouble as a planet. And that I think does uh, make it incumbent upon each of us, each of our brands, each of our, everyone in the audience to find the authentic way that your business can help echo this story. I, I, I want to build on one more thing though, which is Christine shout out to Sana at Diaspora because the other, for me, imperative in this is that climate change and climate justice are inextricably linked. Whether we choose to acknowledge that or not is a different thing, but the facts of the matter, every study you ever read about who's gonna be impacted, how they're gonna be impacted, how that translates into the way the world operates, they are absolutely entwined. And therefore, I actually would challenge the CEOs and founders and investors in the audience to not just feel a moral imperative to talk about climate, but to feel a moral imperative to build climate justice into the foundation of your business model. If you're not doing that, it combined with the storytelling, it, you know, eight and a half years from now, we're going to be looking at the clock in, um, in a deeply, deeply troubled spot. Yeah. And I think it's, a, there, there is a moral imperative for um, every entrepreneur, every investor to actually do the real research. Yeah. Not just not just jump on the bandwagon of yeah. of, uh, of you know popular words that are being bandied about about yeah. climate change, but the fact is none of us is doing uh, good enough. I mean, the yeah. fact is, you know, we're making uh, plant based products. We did a life cycle analysis, and depending on our products, our products are up to ninety eight percent lower in greenhouse gas emissions than their animal dairy counterpart. But but you know what? We're still putting things in plastic. Yeah. And so, you know, there's still a lot more room for us to improve and you have to look at yourself and see, you know, we can't just rest on our laurels and say, you know, we're doing better than somebody else. That's not good enough. We have to continually figure out how can we do better and we have to educate ourselves. I honestly do not feel that um, a lot of people I talk to in the industry are that educated about, about farming practices and climate change and different types of agriculture and how they feed um, into um, uh, whether we're making the world better or worse. I mean, and, and we really have to become experts ourselves in, so that we can make the right choices for everything from supply chain to the types of products we produce. Yeah. Such an incredible. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say, and maybe there comes a reality where we have to say, this product isn't helping the planet. We have to stop making it. Yeah. Such an important, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead, Christine, sorry. Add. Just to echo everything that has been said on the importance of industry leadership. And this is a, a question from the main stage on like, what percentage of people buy food based on climate first? I, you guys can answer that, but from the research we did when I was trying to launch Kinship Foods, which is a regenerative dumpling company, it was low, right? It's not enough to justify you making your decision based on surveys, right? So that's, I think the point that this panel is making is that 
it is not, now is not the time to be trying to make your product just to fit where the consumers are today. We right. need to have visionary leadership to just do what is right. Uh, and, and if you're building your brand just based on what you think the next 18 months of the consumer market is going to, to want, then I just question why you're spending your time doing that. Right. We're going to regret it in eight and a half, nine years yeah. when there's no place to live. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. To build on that, um, it, one of the things that's, that Smoketown, my consultancy does is primary consumer research. So we, we're every, you know, every month or so in deep conversation with a whole lot of people and to reinforce what Christine said, climate actually to reinforce both Christine and Miyoko, hardly anyone buys because of climate. Very, very low on the list because at the end of the day, every product that you buy, the first thing it needs to do is solve the job that you've hired it for, which is to taste good, to make you feel great about life, to, you know, it's, there, there's these higher order things that they have to do, but that doesn't mean that we can't find ways to lead through, through to go through that door of yeah. the primary thing that the brand is doing for you and lead consumers down a path that helps them understand that it's that what's ultimately value valuable is not just what the product is doing for you sort of functionally and somewhat emotionally but also how the product is doing that in such a way that it's going to reverse climate change. Those things are not mutually exclusive. They, they, they can be done at the same time. I, I agree. We have to get people to care and we can do that by getting them in the door first with taste and filling their personal needs. Um, you know, if we just think about how think, how fast things change um, a few years ago, uh, you know, there was no such um, idea concept of um, investing in uh, socially responsible businesses. People were just investors were just looking at the bottom line which companies are growing the fastest, which ones um, you know, have positive EBITDA, et cetera. That's all they cared about. Now, a study came out show, showing that one of the most important things that investors are looking at today is whether or not it's a purpose-driven business. They're looking at purpose as they're considering that as a major factor in whether or not they invest in that business. So the same thing can happen with consumers. Consumers can change to a point where they're taking environment and climate change um, into consideration when they make a product purchase. So we have to get them to care. We can't stop doing that because today's consumer research shows that that's not important. Remember, we have to remember that consumer research only reflects the past up until now. It doesn't reflect the future. It's our responsibility to create the future. Yeah, absolutely. So well said. Um, thinking about how important it is for us to really like like have leaders in food at this point and to not just be thinking about within an 18 month period what the consumer is wanting but to really lead the head of the game uh we had kai note from cuban ice cream as part of our ig live series last season um and spoke really transparently about how difficult it is to actually be ahead of the curve and that like actually be, it's about being part of newer technologies, actually, you know, like a lot of the coconut that's actually coming into the country and that, you know, like there's all these, these difficulties. Um, how transparent should a brand be in conveying that story to their consumer? I think pretty transparent. I mean, I think that's how you tell your story. Um, and, you know, I think that does require needing to vet all of your suppliers, especially if you're a startup, you know, you don't have the opportunity to go visit suppliers in far flung areas of the world, especially during COVID. But that doesn't mean you can't have, um, instead of just buying the cheapest uh, raw material possible, um, it's important to have, you know, a lengthy questionnaire that talks about, uh, that really talks about everything from, you know, um, are you paying fair wages? What are the living conditions of your workers? Um, what are the impacts on the environment? I mean, you can have, you can thoroughly vet your your um, suppliers through just cert questionnaires and asking for certifications and everything. Um, we do that. It's a very lengthy process for us. And sometimes it takes months for a supplier to get back to us. And that helps us sort of weed out the ones that, you know, we're probably not going to be buying from. Um, and then if you can afford it, I think it's important to go visit your suppliers. Um, you know, we did our, we were small too. We didn't have the, the bandwidth to go and fly everywhere, but we did visit our, our primary supplier 
finally, um, over a year ago, um, we went to our cashew farms in, in Vietnam, and I, I learned so much about cashews and, and uh, how they're harvested and, and how they're grown. And I learned they're pretty much a wild crop. They're not farmed at all. Um, so they're a huge uh, um, carbon sink. They just cover vast mountaintops. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a really eye opening for us. And we shared that story. We probably didn't, haven't shared it often enough or as, as, as well enough as, as we should, because we still get people writing to us saying, you know, you're growing all those cashews in the Central Valley. Well, right. <laughs> that's not true. But, right, right. And they're big water, you know, they're using, you're using all the water in California. Well, we don't use any water. I mean, even in Vietnam, it's just rainfall. There's no irrigation at all because it's a wild crop. But, you know, we haven't really told that story well, but so we need to do a better job. Well, you taught me something about cashews. I was, awesome. I was for sure thinking cashews, like in my head, cashews, almond trees, interchangeable. Nope. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's like the opposite. Wow. Totally opposite. Yeah. That's amazing. So, Christine, I want to direct this question uh, next to you. Um, You've done just a, a great job, uh, you know, like looking at how, you know, like your your ag app can really like regenerate the land, build vibrant and just food systems. Um, your story began very personally with food allergies. So in regard to like pushing that food story forward or your personal food story forward, um, firstly, was that was that a part of you building, you know, like connections with farmers initially? And then in addition, how much do you think, you know, like really building off your personal story can be impactful for a brand, a brand's connection to a consumer? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think this perspective I have here on this panel is really as an entrepreneur who that's adjacent to food brands, but, but very much passionate and tied in with the food system. And I think that the, the beautiful thing about almost everyone in the food system as an entrepreneur is, is you all have personal stories. We all have personal stories and connections to food. And it is like fairly easy relative to starting a company and something else to tie that story to something that connects emotionally with the consumer. Um, so yeah, I had food allergies that brought me to work on a bunch of farms, learn about different farming practices all over the world. Uh, and that was definitely going to be, it was like, it fit okay in, in pasture map when I was starting a tech company, cause I was telling that story to farmers, but it would, it was definitely going to fit very well with the, um, with the dumpling brand that I was launching. And so for this audience, some, some people knew that I had sold pasture map and had, was working on a regenerative dumpling brand from the same farmers, uh, but more with more with more tied to my own primary heritage as a Taiwanese and uh, and, and Cantonese person. Uh, and it had a story of inclusion of like regenerative isn't just like people in Sonoma County. It is it, regenerative food. It can be from, the world. It can be from cash and Vietnam, Vietnam, like lots of 99% of food is like produced by indigenous people in different countries that are producing yeah. food regeneratively. And we've like made this a different, anyway, that's a longer story, but I, I, I was, uh, I, I never got past the stage of, of being basically like running out of my own commercial kitchen and, and with terrible packaging and, and struggling publicly about it. And I think that that is a really important part of authentic storytelling. And we throw around the word authentic so much, but the, the reality is that uh, all of you uh, who are entrepreneurs who are watching this, have your own journey. It is very interesting to start a, a food brand. The journey is, is fascinating and people are generally interested in, in food. And that is relative to like enterprise software. There, there's, that, there's, there's a benefit of, of you, you have uh, willing and listening ears uh, and you can tell you all your struggles. And I think you should. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Um, Following on from that, um, Ryan, I know that you love talking about empathy and a lot of the work that you do and find it incredibly important to convey authentic stories. So how can empathy really increase the impact of the marketing choices that a brand makes? Yeah, we, we've sort of been talking about it without naming it, actually, uh, because ultimately what empathy is about is understanding that every single product that we sell, every service that we sell 
is solving a problem in someone's life. And that, and, and people are hiring or buying that product to solve the problem. And they're probably firing something else that is the alternative to it. Like a very simple way of thinking about how we make decisions on what to purchase. And because of that, uh, the more empathetic we are in really, really understanding at a nuanced level, what is the job that this product is being hired to do in someone's life, the more likely you're, be able, you're going to be able to articulate a story about the brand that um, is compelling and that persuades someone to, to see your brand as, an, as a real and, and, uh, and viable solution to the problem that they have. But to, to connect that idea of empathy to the conversation that, that we're having today about climate, part of it is um, recognizing that every single choice that you make from the packaging structure to the ingredients that you choose to use to who you represent on your packaging, on your website, every single choice ideally should be informed by that deep understanding of who you're communicating with and what's gonna be most powerful for them. So if you're trying to convey a climate anchored story, or at least a, a climate influence story, which is what we're all saying, you kind of have a moral obligation to do, the more you understand who your consumer is, the more you understand that audience, the better you're gonna be able to make really refined and nuanced and impactful choices across all aspects of your business that make the, that, that, make that story more powerful. That's great. Um, so important uh, to be able to really like know how strongly to impact a consumer. I know that um, we're getting a little short of time. I'd love to just ask you all, how, how strongly should we like really input like a call to action through our brand? Like how much can we actually bring along the consumer to not just purchase something, but also act beyond that purchase. And I think that's, you know, wrapped up in, you know, education and, and going beyond just the consumer. I think Angie is going to maybe call us quits though. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> and I jump in there. I mean, I really feel like today, um, consumers are ready not just to buy products, but they're ready to uh, join a movement. They're looking for heroes. They're looking for leaders. They're looking yeah. for someone who can help them lead, uh, can lead the movement in the right direction. And I think consumers are, because of social media and, uh, you know, the way we're able to talk to consumers now, um, we're not just products sitting on shelves where the, the products are representative of the brand voice and mission. And so I think it's absolutely critical for, um, for brands to step into, step onto the podium and step into the role of movement leaders and organizers rather than just, Hey, buy my product. It's great. Yeah. And by the way, brands that build movements have higher valuations, have higher levels of loyalty, can command higher price points. Like the, the, the sort of like deep nerdy stuff that we're not really talking about right now, but the stuff that at the end of the day dictates investment, you know, exit, profit margin. Like it, it, it doesn't just matter in the altruistic sense, but it actually makes a huge impact on the business. The only thing I'll add to that, no, Andrew, is that, uh, I personally love brands that are not only calls to action as movement leaders, but also empower their own customers to become activists in the movement. And there's a, there's a real opportunity to, to have people build a participatory movement in brands. Fantastic. Thank you all so, so much. It's been fantastic, even just the small amount of time we've had. Big warm and welcome and thank you again. We learned so much 